It is the official release party for the cat the meaning of Catholic manifesto. The City of God versus City of Man book, which is out now. This book is brought it really brought together the research that I've been doing since college, uh, 10 or 15 years. I was able to draw on things back from back in college, research papers, translations that I had done a long time ago. And it's really a it's uh, indirectly like the first book. It was indirectly sort of autobiographical Mm. in the sense that it was it was basically presenting my own apologia for the Catholic faith in my historical studies. And the reason why I became Catholic and not Protestant or not Eastern Orthodox or not Messianic Jewish. And that's sort of implied in the text here. Uh, but it is a, it is a historical uh, companion to actual Terror of Demons by Kennedy Hall. Terror of Demons by Kennedy Hall is a practical companion to recovering Catholic masculinity. It's very much focused on uh, your spiritual life um, and recovering things. But it also makes mention to the Crusades. And there's a, cha- a chapter on the Crusades in Terror of Demons. And you actually quote, Kennedy quotes uh, a great deal of the Sermon of Urban II. And this text is very much a, a historical companion to that because um, the, the central focus is sort of this, the meaning of Catholic vision. And I'll get to that in a second. But on the other hand, there is this, this um, history of the crusading spirit and the crusading spirit, meaning uh, which I identify with really St. Stephen, the first martyr. And the crusading spirit can be defined as a, mili- a a spiritual militancy against the world, the flesh, and the devil, which can take two different forms externally. It can be a spiritual, a purely spiritual battle, like Saint Stephen, or it can also be a temporal battle, like the Crusaders, who are actually wielding a, a temporal sword and killing people in in war. But in the, in both cases, it is. It is a war that is completely detached from earthly, earthly considerations and earthly uh, attachment whatsoever. It's about the city of God, and and the heavenly city, and that's what is being fought for. Um, and so, the crusading spirit is really what unites Catholics throughout history, in every in every different context that they find themselves in. And that's the and that's what uh, gets into the the masculine piece. And and we talk throughout the book about the effects of effeminacy when there's an effeminate, either either an effeminate cultural tradition or an individual who is effeminate and he makes uh, effeminate decisions. For example, King Henry VIII, very effeminate uh, king, who you know ripped the church apart because he was lustful and wanted to commit adultery, um, and. So it talks, it's very much a dynamic of that, but meaning of Catholic, our, our vision was, uh, its founding was uniting Catholics against the enemies of Holy Church. And so it's a very mm-hmm. militant focus, uh, but it's a, unit, a unifying force. And this is essentially the, this crusading spirit is the force that I see throughout history, which unites these different forces of Christendom. One, it, it battles against the enemies of Christ who take all sorts of different forms. They come from different groups, different religions, but they all unite in what John Rao calls the grand coalition of the status quo. Hmm. And so they're what they really care about is maintaining the status quo and resisting the transforming power of the gospel because Hmm. they wish to keep their power. The unique part about this book is that it is a history, which goes deep into the culture that talks about the effects of each era on the family, on children, uh, the economic factor. um, What is the effect on art, architecture, uh, all sorts of different things that could have come together in this cultural framework. And um, the unifying force is this crusading spirit. And, Another factor, which is not necessarily militant, but becomes militant, and that is the the synthesis of these different parties. So throughout history, we have these different syntheses, which synthesize the faith as these different rival schools of thought are 
basically sort of fighting a good fight, sort of this this rivalry, this contest of humility, which is contesting with one another for the truth. Mm -hmm. And so they are polishing and shaping the truth through trial and and sometimes error. And they're working through this. And, And I've identified in the book, there's four these four different periods of what I call the Greco Roman renewals, which is where there's mm-hmm. a, a renewal of uh, manuscripts or knowledge that brings together uh, greater Greek knowledge, greater Latin knowledge or Syriac knowledge or various things and bringing these different parties together. And then they hammer out the truth through these different debates and rivalries. And so that's what sort of in peacetime, not necessarily in wartime, the church hammers out the truth and ultimately for the sake of the transformative power of the gospel on souls and society. And that's why it is the meaning of Catholic manifesto. It is, uh, that is what this, this organization, this, this uh, podcast and apostolate is all about. It is about bringing together different parties of Catholicism, having us debate with one another and working out the truth. One of the, in fact, uh, I forgot to announce, um, (laughs) <laughs> this Friday, side note, forgot a, a, an important announcement. So this Friday we have, uh, we're, we're f- finalizing the debate about the the Russian contra- consecration. So we've got uh, Robinson Janis, Robinson Janis coming out again on Friday. He's going to defend his thesis, and then we'll have a debate between Sunjanis and Edmund Maza. Doctor Maza. So Doctor Maza versus Doctor Sunjanis. That'll be the debate next week, but. And so that that's an example of, of what we're trying to do at Meaning of Catholic is, is create these debates within Christendom. And this is what gives us this, uh, the what I, in my opinion, is the most compelling hypothesis about the current crisis, the current uh, situation that we find ourselves in, is to ultimately state that uh, Vatican II and sort of this revolution of Vatican II is not actually the cause it's actually the effect of the crisis because the crisis actually was happening before long time. And yeah, Vatican II is actually a, an effect of what was going on. And it's ultimately this breakdown of these rival schools where one, one school is actually suppressing or dominating the other. And then there's this overreaction on either side. And that's what, uh, what I, I believe is the most compelling hypothesis of, of our current crisis. So, that uh, is, an, in a nutshell, is the book. Uh, so if you go to meaningofcatholic.com slash city of God, you have all your purchasing options. So, gentlemen, any thoughts? I, I would think- have had I would have had more thoughts. Uh, I was really excited, actually. Yesterday, you know, I had my day laid out. I, I jotted down what I, my plan was, blocks, you know, of time, hour by hour. And it was dominated by the idea that I was going to read and highlight and scribble in the margins the book. But somebody wasn't able to connect with me and hook me up with that book. And so I never got that book. And so I, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> and it broke my heart, man. I spent I spent the Lord's Day crying. <laughs> I'm like, I was supposed to read it. But no, I, no, um, I, I love it. I, and you know what? I'm so glad that you did it because... Um, it's one of the things that I've really appreciated from the get-go about meaning of Catholic, you know, that we have differences of opinion. And I remember early on, you said something, it was just in passing, you know, and it's one of those, maybe a throwaway comment for you, but it wasn't for me. And it was, it was something like, you know, um, something like I didn't have to say when I agreed with you, but if I, you know, disagree with me, right? Like that kind of thing. It's okay if you have disagreements to, to express them out loud. And you have people, you know, there was kind of confusion, I think, sometimes you'd hear it in the comment sections about, well, that's not what this guy says on the channel, you know, like, well, Kennedy says this about that, or but Tim says this about that, or but Paleocrat says this. And so, like, very quickly, it was kind of a, a brief time, maybe, of some confusion. And, and but over time, it, it became this thing that says, this is a good thing. These are guys that share, there's a common face, there's common core beliefs that we share with mm-hmm. each other. And yet at the same time, we will sit there and valiantly defend our positions, especially when they're different. And and but it's done within an overall context of solid of solidarity and camaraderie. Mm-hmm. And I think that that I think that really stands out. I think it's one of those things that is kind of a crown jewel of this apostolate. And so 
for you to put forward a book that lays out that case, not only as it stands now as a preference for, well, this is our channel and this is the way we'd like to go, but saying this is actually a good thing you can see throughout history. And you can see the advantage of that and the advancement of the kingdom in time. I think it's invaluable. I think that it's priceless. And so I'm really glad you did it. And I'm excited to, to read it. Yeah. Well, I mean, what we're trying to do here is basically be Christendom. Yeah. Uh, in a podcast. Um, and then as a resource. And this book is sort of a history of that Christendom. As God willing, that's what I have attempted to do here. One of the things that um oh, go ahead. No, you go first. You go first. Um, just one of the things that I emphasize during my podcast or um when I recommend the channel Meaning of Catholic, by the way, congratulations on this new uh achievement, Timothy. Is this is not just like you know, Jeremiah mentioned an intellectual discussion or uh, Kennedy, we talk also on the chat. Uh, the reason why we have this apostolate here is for you guys to have a tool, all of us actually have a tool to deal with this world that is absolutely against the faith. It's not just like, you know, talking from ivory towers and just trying to like make ourselves feel smart and all that, which in my case is not even, I'm not even that close to y'all's level, but um, this is providing a resource that we all can benefit from. And personally, like, like we all mentioned before about having different positions and, you know, questioning certain things all within the Catholic spirit. Personally, I mentioned different times and different occasions. I used to be, for example, uh, kind of harsh, not harsh, but kind of hard hearted uh, towards the uh, uh, fraternity of St. Peter. Well, I'm sorry, uh, St. Pius, uh, Society of St. Pius, you know, the favor and all that. And in a weird twist of events is like interacting with people like you guys or even rereading and rechallenging my positions. Um, for example, Pope Francis, when he gave during the year of mis uh, mercy, uh, granted faculties to the Society of St. Pius, um, that kind of, you know, pushed you a little bit, like pushed your boundaries a little bit to re-question things that you were so dogmatic before in certain areas. We're not talking about dogmas like of the faith, obviously, but we're never going to go like questioning the Trinity or the Creed and all that. But in other positions that we may have differences of opinion, that iron sharpening iron actually is great. It's a great benefit. And this is what we see here in the minute of Catholic. This is why I'm so happy and excited to be part of this project because this is not, hey, just come and talk about whatever you know about Spain or Hispanic culture or geopolitics or whatever and just make yourself look good. It's like, no, let's learn from each other. Let's uh, challenge some positions here like that, you know, that can be improved. And let's expand and broaden our horizons, you know, all to advance what Timothy mentioned earlier is christendom christian culture because this is what it's about you know so uh congratulations props to you and i'm very excited to i'm looking forward to reading that book too yeah i i, I agree with jeremiah especially i love valiantly defending my opinion especially when he's wrong like it's one of my <laughs> 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 i knew it was coming i knew it yeah no it's 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 uh yeah uh, as a corollary so <clears throat> our district superior here father david sherry okay of the society uh he's obviously been having to deal with this medication that everybody's worried about you know oh. yeah, leave it off leave it off youtube um and he was trying to explain a principle that is, is is very hard to articulate for a lot of catholics that how can one thing be sinful for one person and not for another person now obviously if something is an intrinsic evil which is very a very high degree hard to get to but with something like a medicine yeah. the reasonings around it the reasoning around it is actually kind of the point you know the the substance Obviously, you know, we don't need to go into the whole moral moral cooperation, uh, you know, remote moral cooperation, grave evil, that sort of thing. But we all know the story. But the point is, is how could some people be in a position where he wouldn't say this was sinful for you, whereas others it would be? And he was trying to explain this position that has been lost on a lot of Catholics, okay? Because it requires distinctions. I'm not yeah. a Thomist. I don't believe there's no salvation outside Thomism, as Tim and I joke. Um, but I do believe that the Thomistic language has been of infinite value to making distinctions because it's just it's just sound philosophical language. Anyway, it's very helpful. But we've lost that, of course. So he was trying to explain, like, the, the Protestants exalt the conscience to be basically God himself, which is an error, okay? So as a reaction to that, we almost believe that, like, there's no such thing as conscience. It's like, my conscience is the Catechism of Trent. And, like, that's all I think, <laughs> you know? And that's fine. That you probably go to, uh, that's a good thing, if you know, but how do you apply that to prudential realities and things? Yeah. And he was explaining that, you know, if you're convicted about something and you have good reasons for it and you've formed your conscience and you've prayed about it, you've read about it, and then you go against that, that's the sin. 
That's yeah. the sin. The sin is you've, you've, you, you, I don't know what you'd call that, but he, and it makes perfect sense. And, but that's something that was understood by Catholics where you could have a conscience that was immovable, but it wasn't because you exalted it over divine revelation or you exalted it over the magisterium. It's because you flooded it with those things and you came to a conclusion that that's the only one you can have. Mm -hmm. And um, Catholics for centuries understood that, which is why you could have the Franciscans and the Dominicans, both incredible orders historically in the church, like almost excommunicating each other. I mean, like on the razor's edge, but they weren't, they were, there was the opposite of pride. It was, it was, I can't agree with you because like I would be, I'd be lying, you know, and, and it might be wrong. I mean, you find out a hundred years later, these people flesh this out, but that's been completely lost. And amongst traditionalists, so-called traditional minded, let's say traditional minded, um, we don't know how to do that very well either. Um, we really don't. Um, and unfortunately, one of the problems in traditional Catholicism or the traditionalist, traditional minded movement, let's say, mm -hmm. is um, because we don't know how to do it. We don't also know how to reconcile with things from the post conciliar era that are just happened to be true mm -hmm. because we don't know how to make the distinctions. And uh, one of the things I was thinking about as I was reading through some political philosophers from the 1800s in France, which is an era that we would call the Enlightenment, obviously, right? And I'm reading through these philosophers and they had really good ideas. Now, they weren't Enlightenment thinkers, but they're in this category of people in the Enlightenment. And, uh, but I thought to myself, you know, it's a strange thing. It's almost like we give the devil more than he's due. It's like we think that, we think that Catholic thought stopped progressing just because an evil movement started in the same country. You know, like there's still, yeah. there was still this, there was still Catholicism. And, and even though there was Robespierre and all these wackos, there was still a, a progression. Like we, we see true progression in the church. We see the early church. We see the church fathers. We see the medievals. We see the scholastics. We see the, theolo you know, whatever the order is. And uh, they're still figuring out things in the 1700s that are traditional, but they're a thousand years later than something, as, you know, in the 700s. Anyway, this spirit of true debate is something that has to continue till the end of time um, because we will never know all the truths until then anyway. Mm -hmm.